now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks very much, uh, thanks very much Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I'm going to ask my first uh, question this morning to the Minister of Long-Term Care, and I'm going to start by quoting directly uh, from the Commission report. 26 residents died due to dehydration prior to the arrival of the Canadian Armed Forces team due to the lack of staff to care for them. They died when all they needed was water and a wipe down. Yesterday, this minister repeatedly refused to answer a basic question. When did this minister responsible for long-term care know that seniors in long-term care were dying from neglect and dehydration? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, any loss of life in these circumstances during this pandemic have, have been, has been tragic. And the reason we called in the military, the Canadian Armed Forces, was because all the measures that had been taken uh, were, were not sufficient to address the growing demand. And that is why they were called upon. Uh, we know that the staffing collapse uh, in these homes from, from multiple reasons uh, is what necessitated calling in the military. It still took time to get them into the home, and COVID uh, was, was a very rapid threat. So I've said before that I am committed to making sure that long-term care is a better place to live, a better place to work. These lives lost cannot Spons. be in vain. We will improve these conditions, and that is currently what we're doing with the staffing, uh, the new capacity, the IPAC measures. We are working to make sure that these lies were not lost. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the minister's still not responding to the question. The Minister of Health hasn't responded to questions. Nobody on that side of the House is taking any responsibility. They're not being accountable for what happened to long-term care with COVID-19. In fact, it's clear that government ministers knew exactly what was going on in long-term care. In fact, the CEO of the uh, RNAO, Doris Grinspan, uh, gave a testimony to the Commission uh, that uh, says the Minister of Treasury Board and Finance was calling her to try to get help for Orchard Villa. And I quote from the Commission's report from Doris's testimony. So I got the phone call at about 11 o'clock p.m. one day, and in that phone call was the Minister telling me, can I help with Orchard Villa before things were public, that it was a disaster what had happened with the residents. Speaker, did this Member, did this Minister of Long-Term Care receive the same kind of panicked calls from the Minister of Finance with the same kind of information and the same kind of request for help? Thank you, Speaker. I have said time and time again uh, that I take responsibility for this, for the well-being of the residents, for the, for the staff and for the families. And in fact, that is why I came to politics in the first place, out of concern for the issues surrounding the neglect of long-term care. Having witnessed it personally uh, with my family members, I know how hard it is on families, having witnessed it as a physician for almost 30 years. And so there is no doubt that I have a sense of responsibility for this, and I have said it repeatedly. I do not know why this does not seem to register with the, the, the member opposite, the leader of the opposition. She does not seem to want to acknowledge that for some reason. We are taking responsibility for a broken system, and COVID moved so fast. We heard this time and time again. You know, a home would be fine at the beginning of the week, and within days, it was a war zone. I have said that repeatedly. So speed Response. was of the essence to work with our medical officers of health, the chief medical officer of health, Ontario Health, the acute care sector, to bring to bear on these homes the support that they needed. Uh, and, and we can... Thank you. Final supplementary. Here, what's clear is the ministers uh, in this government were protecting each other and worried about things going public instead of protecting seniors and worrying about them. Uh, in fact, on March 30, 2020, uh, this minister stood with the Premier and claimed that there was going to be an iron ring put around long-term care, which we all know never happened. On March 31st, the next day, 
The minister's own staff were pleading for more PPE in long-term care. And then, of course, in early April, a few days later, the Minister of Finance is begging the RNAO to send nurses into Orchard Villa, pleading for help. I ask this minister one more time, Speaker, when did she know that seniors in long-term care homes in Ontario were dying of neglect and dehydration? Minister of Long care. Thank you, Speaker. And I've, I've told the member uh, opposite repeatedly uh, that the reason we called in the military was because the speed with which COVID moved in some homes uh, made the homes into a war zone. It happened very quickly. The premise of your question uh, is, is bordering on obscene. And, 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 I, and the reason why is because all of the ministry, public health, medical officers of health, thousands of people have been working to shore up these homes, and they were no match for COVID-19. And so to impugn, to impugn that there was any attempt uh, in terms of what you have just said uh, is, is inaccurate, is not based on any fact, it is unfounded. What we were doing Response. 24 hours a day was trying to get support to those homes with an unknown virus that wasn't fully understood, with a sh you know, shortage of, of supplies globally, we were taking every measure and working collaboratively with all the partners to solve this problem. And I reject the Thank you. The next question. Again, the Leader of the Opposition. It's also for the Minister of Long-Term Care, but I can assure her what is obscene and what Ontarians think is obscene is 4,000 seniors dying in COVID, uh, from COVID-19 in long-term care because they didn't do their jobs. But look, the Canadian Armed Forces, again to the Minister, uh, arrived on uh, April 29th. They started uh, to go into the homes, uh, and of course their report was released on May 29th. Uh, certainly, in between the time they arrived and the time the report uh, was made public, this minister would have received some kind of updates as to what was happening in these long-term care homes. Yet, on May 19th, the minister told this House, and I quote, Our government has acted quickly and responsibly and will continue to take more action at a rapid pace until this pandemic is over, which we all know never happened. There was never any rapidity. So, what does this minister say to families? What does she say to the families who were she was supposed to be protecting when she wasn't Question. doing so? When the armed forces found those people pleading for, for water? Let's face it, this minister needs to resign. Will she do so? Mr. Blanchard. Thank you, Speaker. You know, it, it, is, it is devastating to families. There's no doubt about that. I have taken responsibility for their well-being and their welfare, and it is, it is devastating to all the people who have been working around the clock, the staff, uh, the public service, uh, the frontline providers, the emergency services, the funeral homes, everyone who has come together to try and provide the support in a time of a global pandemic, a hundred-year pandemic, a hundred years since the world has any, ever seen anything like this. And, and I want to acknowledge all of the people that have worked so hard uh, to provide the care to these homes, that is, you know, when that fails, uh, that is what we had to do, is call in the military. And I understood the need to get them in swiftly, but even the military took a number of days to come in. And so when we look at the speed with which COVID moves, Response. we need to understand the learning process that the whole world was going through and all the people that were working so hard to support these homes, the residents and staff and families. Thank you. Supplementary question. For over a year, this minister denied the crisis in long-term care instead of stopping it. She refused to support seniors in long-term care. She stood by the Premier's fallacy 
of a ring, an iron ring around long-term care. She actually said in this House that they were moving quickly and reasonably, literally while the Canadian Armed Forces were, were finding people dying of neglect in long-term care homes. Speaker, this minister has tried to save the Ford government and save her own reputation instead of saving people in long-term care. How can anybody expect this minister can fix things when she can't even admit to her mistakes? Will she resign today? take ministerial accountability for the things she was supposed to do and didn't do to protect seniors in long-term care. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker. If the Leader of the Opposition had done her job during the time that the previous Order. government Order. neglected long-term care, if you had been a voice, if you had taken the opportunity that you had years and years of runway that you wasted, that the Leader of the Opposition closed her eyes to. Go back to the Hansard. Look how many times she even bothered Order. to mention the long-term care word. Look at your failure. I was left to pick up the pieces from a devastating 15 years of neglect. I will not be spoken to that way by the Leader of the Opposition that order. neglected this sector opposition and the opposition at the time neglected this sector. Order. 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 Just a second. I'm going to remind all members to make their comments through the chair and not directly across the floor at each other. This is the final supplementary. Speaker, this minister has not even committed to implementing the recommendations of the Commission. It is unfathomable that she didn't simply say, yes, we're going to implement every one of those recommendations. Instead, what we saw was staff literally being abandoned by their minister during this crisis. Many of them have now left the sector, and understandably so. We now have an immediate staffing crisis that is worse than when COVID-19 hit Ontario in the first place. The commissioner said clearly, staff need higher wages right now. Staff need full-time work right now. We need more staff right now, not three years from now, not two years from now, right now. Five days later, the minister still refuses to apologize, still, as you just saw, will not admit to her failure. Question. This minister needs to resign. Will she finally do what she should do, resign from her position? Mr. Long-term care. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I really don't know where the Leader of the Opposition is coming up with this, this, uh, um, this distortion. Our government has addressed on a continuing basis, even as I became the Minister of Long-Term Care, looking at the staffing, looking at the capacity building. And we've been doing this all throughout the pandemic with a sense of urgency, understanding the need for this, for this sector. In the first wave with the pandemic pay, we were able to hire 8,600 and more staff into long-term care. We began uh, before that with a staffing expert panel to inform us on what we would could do to improve the staffing. We have uh, created capacity in our colleges, our public colleges, for over 8,000 students to be trained by, by the fall. Uh, we have another uh, pro program with uh, career colleges and, uh, and district school boards. Uh, we have an Ontario Reserve Response. Senior Support System that we arranged in the first wave. I do not understand where you're, you're, you're getting this information from. We've been very clear. We're building the capacity. We're building the staff. We're building the IPAC. We're doing all these recommendations and working on them, uh, some of them prior. Thank you. The next question, once again, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question this morning is uh, to the Minister of Health. Um, the CEO of the Registered Nurses uh, said that the Minister of Finance called her uh, about the crisis unfolding in his riding in Orchard Villa. Uh, and I'm going to again quote from her testimony. So I got the phone call at about 11 p.m. one day, and in that phone call was the minister telling me, can I help with Orchard Villa, before things were public, that it was a disaster what had happened with the residents, and he was, an excruciatingly, he was excruciatingly in pain. So the government knew 
Speaker, what was unfolding in long-term care. Ministers knew what was happening in the long-term care sector. They knew the staffing problems were serious and that people were losing their lives, that people were abandoned in their rooms. Did the Minister of Health receive the same phone call with the same information and the same plea from the Minister of Finance? Reply, Government House Leader. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, as the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition will know, and I would certainly hope that uh, members opposite were, uh, were doing the same thing that members on this side of the House were doing. We're engaging with, uh, uh, with our community members, whether it was long-term care, retirement homes, uh, uh, individuals of, uh, in community support groups, Mr. Speaker. We were all engaging and we were all working very hard to see how we could help. I, I, I don't see how the member opposite, the Leader of the Opposition opposite, can suggest that members of Parliament shouldn't be doing that on a daily basis, especially given the fact that this is a global health and economic pandemic but the Minister of long-term care is quite correct many of the issues that we faced were issues that we inherited after decades of neglect in the sector we have made a commitment to make uh, make them better we inherited a system that was woefully underfunded we inherited a system uh, that had not been uh, built out that did not have spaces I had a hundred and eighteen year waiting list in my riding before this government was elected mr. speaker uh, we're making changes to make lives better for the Response. people in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. It's a responsibility we all have, all of us on both sides of the House, and we all will get the job done for seniors. The opposition. Well, speaker, what this minister forgot to mention is that the Ford government was cutting long-term care in 2019's budget, and in 2018, one of the first things they did was cancel the comprehensive resident quality inspection. So they really do have a problem with their own history. But look, the same minister, the same minister that de denied more funding for long-term care in February knew that there was a disaster unfolding. He wouldn't cough up the money. The disaster continued to unfold. The entire Ford cabinet knew what was going on, and yet they all continued to claim there was an iron ring around long-term care. How is that possible? The Minister of Long-Term Care, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Finance, now the government House Leader, none of them will take any responsibility for 4,000 seniors losing their lives in long-term care Question. because they wouldn't spend the money and they wouldn't act quickly enough to save those lives. They all need to take some responsibility. When will they? Government House Leader. Uh, let's be very clear, Mr. Speaker. We will accept responsibility for the things that uh, that uh, uh, fall under our watch, and that's why we are making significant investments. Uh, but to be clear, Mr. Speaker, uh, all legislatures for a number of years share the responsibility of the woeful inadequacy in this sector. Woeful inadequacy of this of this sector, a sector that had not been invested in for decades. We immediately moved to make investments in long-term care. Before the election, we talked about ending hallway health care. That is why the Minister of Health brought forward Ontario Health Teams, a blanket of care, Mr. Speaker, that included long-term care, included, included acute care, included uh, ICUs, like home care for communities, Mr. Speaker. We've made those investments, Mr. Speaker. We're adding homes every single day, the largest build-out of long-term care in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker. What happened is completely Response. unacceptable. We accept responsibility for those things, Mr. Speaker, but to be clear, generations of parliamentarians who have sat in this place have failed seniors, but we will make sure that that stops, and we started to make sure it stopped in 2000. Order. The, op the opposition come to order. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of uh, Small Business and Red Tape Production. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for weeks now on this side of the House, we have been calling on the federal government uh, to secure our international borders and stop the flow of COVID-19 variants into our country. Minister Blair and Minister Haidu don't think this is a serious concern, but since February, thousands of international travelers have tested positive for COVID-19 variants of interest and variants of concern. Mr. Speaker, does our government recognize the seriousness of various variants of concern of flying in through our airports and driving in our land borders? What is the government doing to address this? The Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Production. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. More than 5,000 air travel passengers have tested positive for COVID-19 since February. And the Premier and this government have constantly been asking for the federal government to secure our borders and keep Ontarians safe. But the federal government has dragged their feet. We now have confirmed cases of the B1617 variant in Ontario, in Quebec, in British Columbia. We needed stronger action like countries in the UK, Australia, who were able to secure their borders and keep their communities safe. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to call on the federal government to close all the loopholes. You can still take a connecting flight into Ontario and carry one of these deadly variants into the province. We need to protect Ontarians, we need to keep uh, Canadians Response. safe, and we need to ensure that the federal government takes stronger actions on our border. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. More than 90% of new cases in Ontario are variants. The B117 variant first found in the United Kingdom is now the dominant form of COVID-19 here in Ontario. The federal government does not think securing our borders is a priority, but if they had taken action before it was too late, we may have been able to avoid this third wave. Mr. Speaker, it is still better late than never. Will the minister call upon the federal government to finally take action to secure our borders? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know the significant impact that these variants are having across Ontario uh, through the third wave. Uh, we know that 90% of current cases are from variants. We now have confirmed cases of B1617 uh, variant in Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. We need stronger actions. Premier Ford led the country in implementing uh, testing at our airports before the federal government uh, was able to do anything. We have secured our land borders. We have put uh, OPP come to order. controls at our land borders in Manitoba and Quebec. Currently, people are flying to the United States to avoid quarantining and crossing and walking over our federal borders in New York and Windsor and other places. We need the federal government to act now to secure Ontarians, to keep Canadians safe, and we're calling on the federal government once again to address the borders and, keep and secure, our, uh, secure Ontario. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Last year, a shadowy group called Vaughan Working Families spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads attacking teachers. While at the same time, this government attacked teachers every day during their contract talks. The Vaughan Working Families Group is a front for a company called Vaughan Health Campus of Care, who were longtime big donors to the PCs. We wrote to Elections Ontario about the attack ads as they may be considered illegal under election laws. And now, a full year later, after the ads ran, we've received confirmation the RCMP is now investigating. Now that the RCMP is involved, is there anything else this Premier or his Minister of Education would like to tell Ontarians what they know about these attack ads against teachers? To reply. The Thank government you, House Leader. Speaker, I have, uh, I guess unlike the member opposite, I have full faith in uh, Elections Ontario to continue to do its, uh, its job, Mr. Speaker. What I do know when it comes to whether it's uh, uh, education, whether it's health care, whether it's transit and transportation, uh, the member is quite correct. We are making significant investments to keep uh, our, our students, uh, our students uh, safe through COVID-19. Uh, the member opposite is quite correct. We are making significant investment in transit and transportation so that we can get people moving around so that we can unleash the potential of the Ontario economy once we get through uh, uh, this COVID pandemic, uh, Mr. Speaker, but obviously in the short term, we're going to be remain focused on making sure that we keep the health and safety of the people of the province of Ontario uh, top of mind, Mr. Speaker. That is why the Minister for Small Business and Red Tape so effectively pointed out how important it is that the federal government step up to the plate finally and secure our borders. If the member opposite wants to be helpful, he can call his Response. federal cousins in, uh, in, in Ottawa and ask them to push to secure the Ontario border so that we can keep these variants out of the province of Ontario. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And again to the Premier, I guess they didn't like the question. 
One of the people clearly involved Order. in the group, Quinto Anabale, is a development lawyer this Premier appointed to be vice chair of the LCBO. He's also been a very generous donor to the PC Order. and supported the health minister when she ran for the party leadership. We asked the Government Agencies Committee to bring Mr. Anabale forward so we could ask questions, but the government blocked our attempts. Now the RCMP are involved in getting to the bottom of this shady group, the Vaughan Working Families. Ontarians deserve to know if the Premier's still fine with Mr. Anabali's role at the LCBO. Will the Premier now allow the Government Agencies Committee to bring forward Mr. Anabali for questions about his involvement with Vaughan Working Families? And the reply, again, Government House Leader. Again, uh, to, to be very clear, uh, Mr. Speaker, I am uh, very confident that uh, Elections Ontario has uh, uh, what it needs to, uh, to uh, ensure that, uh, uh, that all those who are participating or want to participate in elections in the province of Ontario do so fairly. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, unlike the member opposite, I have confidence that uh, Elections Ontario will do that. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are going to continue to remain focused on what's important to the people of the province of Ontario. And what's important to the people of the province of Ontario right now is that we chart a path out of this COVID-19 mess, Mr. Speaker. We are seeing variants of, control, of concern out of control at our borders. That's what we need to focus on, Mr. Speaker. We need the assistance of the members opposite to help us to convince the federal government to secure our borders. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything that we can to make sure that all Ontarians get vaccines in their arm. Over five million doses have Member been for Don Valley today, East, come to order. The that Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, come to order. The province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, we're doing all that we can. We're attacking this virus in hot spots. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and very soon we'll be able to unleash the potential of the Ontario economy and get people back to work, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, Member for Simcoe Gray. Uh, speaker, my question is for the Minister of Long Term Care. 36 per cent of people living in Wasaga Beach are seniors. The town is one of the top 10 postal codes in all of Canada for its high percentage of senior citizens, and that number is rapidly growing. Government Surprisingly, Wasaga Beach has no long-term care beds, despite years of my asking for them. Residents are forced to leave their community to access care. My constituents are perplexed that last month's budget made no mention of long-term care in Wasaga Beach. We were hoping for some beds. Can the minister give my constituents an explanation? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member from Simcoe Gray uh, for the question. Uh, Wasaga Beach is a community like so many that the previous government uh, neglected with respect to long-term care. The previous government, the previous Liberal government, only built 611 new spaces between uh, 2011 and 2018, and they failed to meet the needs of communities across the province, like Wasaga Beach. Our government is making up for lost time, and along with building new homes, we're taking innovative approaches to solve long-standing problems. In November of last year, our government announced the expansion of community paramedicine programs. This initiative will help seniors stay safe while living in the comfort of their own home. Uh, both Simcoe and Gray Counties were offered places in our government's expanded community paramedicine program. And the supplementary. Well, thank you for that answer. The minister may know, uh, Speaker, that at least two companies are prepared to fill the void uh, for long-term care beds in Wasaga Beach. Primacare applied two years ago for a 160-bed facility in the community, and Jarlett Health Services hopes to locate a greenfield facility there, providing for 96 seniors. Both of these uh, are reputable companies with proven track records. They have the resources, the experience, and the commitment to deliver the urgently needed support that my constituents need and deserve. And Speaker, I certainly appreciate the pressure on the government, on the minister, in terms of the need for long-term care beds across the province. And as a former minister of health, I, I kept track of this issue quite clearly over the years, and I was astounded for 15 years that the previous government built no beds. They took credit for 6,000 beds that Mike Harris had put in place of the 15,000 that he built during the first part of the McGuinty government, but they built no net new beds over 15 years. So I know there's a backlog. Question. I just want you to consider Wasaga Beach, top 10 postal codes in Canada for senior citizens. We need beds. Minister, will you give them serious consideration in the next round of allocations? Minister of Long-Term Care. 
Thank you, Speaker. And again, thank you to the member from uh, Simcoe Gray for his question. The most recent group of allocations prioritized upgrading older homes in response to the lessons learned around improved infection prevention and control measures, particularly the elimination of three and four bed ward rooms. Uh, this was addressing also the addressing the growing needs of diverse groups, including Francophone and Indigenous communities, and promoting campuses of care to better address the specialized care needs of residents. Applications that have not received an allocation in this round will be kept and considered for future potential allocations. In addition to the 750 existing spaces at nine homes in Simcoe Gray, there are currently three projects in the development pipeline that will build 121 new spaces and upgrade another 169 spaces to modern design standards. And so I thank the member opposite for his question. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Uh, speaker, in addition to an inadvocate and ineffective border measures that have been challenging our provincial public health response by bringing variants of concern into the province, on Friday, Prime Minister Trudeau once again confused Canadians with his message that Ontarians had requested a ban on international students. Speaker, this came as a surprise to me. Our government has always been very clear on the protocols for students and residents coming uh, or returning to Ontario and the public health guidelines they must abide by to help in our efforts to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Speaker, would the minister please help to clear up the confusion that the Prime Minister created? The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for that important question and for all of his work advocating for a better post-secondary future. Uh, in his community of Brampton. Mr. Speaker, he is right that there was a lot of confusion caused uh, by the Prime Minister's remarks, so perhaps we could take this as a learning lesson for all of us and set the record straight. What this government has called for and what we've been very clear on in four letters to the federal government is to take stricter measures at the border to prevent variants of concern from entering this country. We've called for a ban on all non-essential travel. We've called for mandatory PCR testing for interprovincial travelers. We've called to close the loophole at our land borders, and we've called for proper enforcement of hotel quarantining. Mr. Speaker, we continue to be very clear, crystal clear to the federal government. We're imploring them to take stricter measures at the border. Speaker, we know that 90 percent of variants of concern are entering through our, prop, our improperly enforced borders. And, Speaker, now is not the time for division. Response. Now is not the time for the sort of division that the Prime Minister's remarks create. Now is the time to work together. We again call on the federal government, get strict, get real at our borders. And the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the parliamentary assistant for clarifying the confusing and incorrect statement that the Prime Minister made on Friday. I know that many international students and post-secondary institutions were concerned about what these measures would mean and were looking to their provincial government to once again step up when their federal government would not. This has been the case for paid sick leave, uh, Mr. Speaker, imposing strong but necessary restrictions to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and now standing up for our international students. Speaker, would the parliamentary assistant please elaborate on what our government is doing to ensure that international students entering into Ontario are doing so in a safe way that does not pose a risk to themselves, their classmates, and all Ontarians? Again, the parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for that important question. So let me be clear again. What we are calling for from the federal government is strict border measures adequate screening, and properly enforced quarantine. What we have done with our post-secondary institutions, with our designated learning institutes in the province of Ontario, is we've worked actively with them, each of them, and their local public health officers to develop individually tailored solutions for proper quarantining and measures for arriving students. We've done it to ensure the safety of those communities, to ensure the safety on campus, and to ensure safety of those students arriving, Mr. Speaker. And while I'm at it, Mr. Speaker, when we work collaboratively together with our institutions, 
We've increased mental health supports on our campuses. When we work collaboratively with our institutions, Mr. Speaker, we've supported them with micro-credentials. When we've worked collaboratively, what? we've launched free PSW training to tackle the health profession's backlog. Mr. Speaker, when we work together, we can accomplish an anything. That's why we're calling on the federal government. Work with us. Listen to the municipalities. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through to the Minister of Health, this government's failure to prepare for the third wave has left our hospitals on the verge of collapse. This means that while ICU's beds are overflowing, thousands of essential surgeries have had to be delayed. Tragically, we're now hearing stories of cancer patients who've lost their lives after cancelled surgeries. This government's failure to provide hospitals with the support they need is only going to make stories like these more common. What is the minister's plan to address the hospital capacity issue, and will she make the necessary investments now to save lives in Ontario's hospitals? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, and I thank the member for the question. In fact, we have uh, in invested over $5 billion in our hospitals since the start of this pandemic. We've created over 3,400 new beds, uh, equivalent of six large community hospitals. We've created several hundred new intensive care spaces because of the increasing volumes of COVID-19 patients we knew were going to be coming into our hospitals. We have prepared for that throughout. We are preparing to deal with expanding our capacity yet again and making sure that we have the health human resources in order to operate in those situations. As to the surgical backlogs, uh, it is uh, unfortunate that it's necessary for us to pause in some of these surgeries because of the influx of COVID patients. However, despite that, we were able to do over 420,000 surgeries uh, since the start of the pandemic for people who required surgery for cardiac cancer or for other reasons. And as soon as the numbers start going down, both in terms of the number of cases Response. and the number of people in hospitals, we will get back to that as quickly as we can because we know many people have been waiting for surgeries for a long period of time, and that is a priority for us to make sure they get the surgeries that they need. And the supplementary question. Well, I guess that means there is no plan, Speaker. This government's now patting themselves on the back for telling hospitals that they might be able to avoid the worst of their triage protocols. To be clear, people are already dying because of hospital capacity. They're dying because they've had life-saving surgeries cancelled. They're dying in hospitals hundreds of kilometres away from their homes and families. And even if we avoid the province's worst-case scenario, this has already been the worst-case scenario for many Ontario families and for the doctors and nurses working on the front lines. My question again to the Health Minister, will she take responsibility for the capacity crisis, and what is she doing now to save the lives of patients in our hospital system? Mr. Health. Well, I would say to the member through you, Mr. Speaker, that we have been creating capacity. We have been dealing with this since the beginning of this pandemic. We've been creating more space in our hospitals. As far as dealing with the surgical backlog previously, we uh, invested over $500 million in order to expand the operating hours in our hospitals to evenings and weekends to make sure that we took a regional look at a regional waiting list so that we could expand our surgeries into all of our hospitals. This is something that we will continue once this this pandemic, the crisis of this pandemic is over because it makes use of all of those spaces and gets people into operating rooms and surgeries to have their uh, necessary work done as soon as possible. There are many steps that we have taken and that we will continue to take to make sure that the people in our hospitals are frontline health care heroes who have been at this for over a year now. We can never thank them enough for the work that they're doing. We're truly Response. grateful for all of that, but we have been working alongside our health care workers uh, beside our hospitals to make sure that we have the capacity that we need so that anyone coming into our hospitals Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. I wrote to the minister and her government about the state of long-term care and the government's slow response to COVID. Yet despite many calls, especially from families, to protect residents and staff, your government was slow to respond and even took a summer break. On page 129 of the Commission's report, it's titled Slow, Late and Reactive, the Early Provincial Response. Can you tell this House what you did in the months of July and August to prepare for the second wave of the pandemic in long-term care to protect vulnerable seniors and to remedy the staffing 
that the Canadian Armed Forces, the FAO, labour unions, members of the opposition, the media and families were calling on you to do. Will you accept and act on the 85 recommendations that make up the recommendations of this report, make them public Price. as is requested in Recommendation 85 on an annual basis to this legis legislature on your progress. Mr. Longton, thank you, Speaker. You know we've been very clear uh, since we asked for the commission. Uh, to be set up uh, for long-term care. We've been very clear about our intent to make the report public, which we have done. Uh, we've also been very clear um, about uh, making sure that we address the recommendations in that report uh, to understand what we've already implemented, what needs to be implemented. Uh, we are completely open to addressing all of those 85 recommendations uh, as soon as we understand uh, what has already been done and what is in progress and what needs to be done. And, you know, the difference is really that our government is taking action, that reports really littered the landscape, uh, the political landscape under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, report after report ap after report. Uh, on direct hours of care, four hours of direct care, on the capacity issues. And the, you know, the member opposite from Ottawa South, he knew full well that the wardrooms posed a, a threat. And in terms of this, uh, uh, looking at uh, preparedness, absolutely, we worked uh, around the clock uh, with many, many partners, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Public Health Ontario. We created uh, a... Uh, Thank you. The supplementary question. So, Mr. Speaker, if the member... Uh, the minister knew the threat. Why were you slow to act? And that's really the question and the substance of this report. I will send you the letter I wrote to you on March 27th and again on May 19th. You know, my question was specifically, what did you do over the summer to prepare for that second wave? Because there were more deaths in long-term care in the second wave than in the first. And so, you know, I've been listening to the response and it doesn't go far enough. This report is devastating. It's devastating to the families, to the staff, and to the people who are closest impacted. Minister, through you, Speaker, will you apologize today to these families? And if you can't bring yourself to apologize, you must resign. Again, I remind my members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the, the report is very insightful, and I thank the commissioners uh, for their insights. Uh, I, I really think that it was intended to provide us with guidance, Order. Uh, and that is what it has done. So, you know, in late June, if, if uh, the member opposite Center, would, would, would choose to listen, I will, I, will, uh, I will give her the information she's looking for. In late June of 2019, our government created the first standalone Ministry of Long-Term Care to address the systemic challenges, and the Commission is very clear in the report, of these long-standing systemic issues, uh, numerous times throughout the report. Uh, and, and just a few months later, COVID-19 struck our province. Our government has consistently relied on the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Ontario Health, Public Health Ontario, countless medical experts. And last summer, preparedness assessments were carried out across the province to help long-term care homes with emergency and outbreak prevention. This was in addition to shoring up the, the staffing in the home using the resident support aids, uh, hiring 8,600 plus hire in, hires into, into long-term care with the pandemic pay. Homes were encouraged to, to work with their hospital partners and Ontario Health assisted with that. This was a, co a collaborative, cooperative effort and, uh, and absolutely we must take responsibility for repairing this long neglected system and we will continue to do Order. Member for Ottawa South come to order. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Last month, I had the pleasure of joining our federal and municipal partners representing our government to announce infrastructure investments that will improve the local public, uh, public transit system in the city of Brampton. Mr. Speaker, I was thrilled to see that our government has invested over $58.2 million for the latest Brampton Transit project. This funding will help ensure that Brampton's residents and visitors will be able to access more efficient and safe transit services, getting people where they want to go when they want to get there. I'm proud that our government is working with our municipal partners and federal counterparts to get these projects built, and I know my constituents are looking forward to a faster and more reliable commuting experience. 
Can the minister tell us how she is working with the federal government and our municipal partners to make meaningful investments for the people of Brampton? The parliamentary assistant, the member for Oakville. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member uh, for this important question and for his continued advocacy on, the, on behalf of the people of Brampton. We have now have nominated over 760 projects to the federal government for ICEP for approval. This includes 140 road, bridge, air, and marine infrastructure projects for a total provincial investment of more than $115 million in over 200 public transport, transit infrastructure projects throughout the outside GTHA public transit stream. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, although COVID-19 has forced the world to slow down, we have not stopped building. Since January, we've made nearly 60 joint virtual events, like the one the member mentioned, delivering exciting news about infrastructure funding in partnership with the federal government, nonprofits, and municipalities. These projects can finally go from shovel ready to shovels Response. moving to get much needed infrastructure projects built. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. We have heard both the Minister and the Premier say that our government is investing $145 billion in Ontario's infrastructure over 10 years for broadband connectivity, transit and highways, schools and hospitals. And we know that this is a record level infrastructure investment. Part of this investment includes the project I announced on behalf of the Minister of Infrastructure last month. Uh, this project includes the construction of nearly 400,000 square foot transit maintenance and storage facility. Uh, this facility will accommodate about 250 buses and will, will help improve the quality, capacity and safety of transit infrastructure in Brampton. It will also support future installation of infrastructure to service electric buses and that will mean cleaner, more efficient transportation for all Bramptonians. This was very welcome news by my community. Can the parliamentary assistant explain when can we expect more infrastructure investments like the one recently announced? Thank you, Speaker. And uh, as you know, the project announced in the city of Brampton is part of more than 200 public transit projects we've submitted for review and recently received approval on from the federal government. This multi-government collaboration is a primarily an example of how everyone can benefit when governments work together. Our ministry will continue to work with the federal counterparts to secure timely project approvals and much needed funding to fill the infrastructure deficit left by the previous Liberal government for communities like yours in Brampton. We know there is more work to be done, but we can't do it alone. That's why the Premier and the Minister of Infrastructure continue to work with the federal government for advocating for up to seeking an additional $10 billion per year over 10 years to get shovels in the ground for infrastructure projects. Through strategic investments, we can continue to help improve the quality of life for everyone in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the federal government announced that it would take over the environmental assessment process for the Highway 413 mega project that would cut through the Green Belt. Just last week, the Minister of Transportation claimed there was a, quote, strong case, end quote, for this highway project, even though the most recent review found that this $6 billion highway pet project would only save drivers maybe 30 to 60 seconds per trip. Maybe. In fact, the only people who still think there is any case for this project are the well-connected speculators who own land along the corridor, whose political donations have filled the coffers of the PC party, and who are doggedly clinging to their hopes for this highway. Will the Premier reverse course on the 413 and cancel this wasteful and destructive gift to his friends and donors? Mr. Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. It's unclear at this time what this federal designation means for this project. We don't know the scope of the federal impact, what the scope of the federal impact assessment would be, or whether a full federal impact will be sought. So we look forward to receiving more information from the federal government, who has already acknowledged how robust Ontario's individual EA process is. The Impact Assessment Agency of Canada has concluded that concerns surrounding environmental impacts are, and I quote, expected to be addressed through federal and provincial regulatory processes that already exist, Mr. Speaker. As recently as March of 2020, the experts at the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada 
reviewed the evidence and declined to take further action against the GTA, GTA West project. The agency stated at that time that the GTA West does not fit the criteria for a project to be considered under the Impact Assessment Act. Response. The goal of this project, Mr. Speaker, has always been to address congestion and population growth for the people of Ontario. The federal government is seeking additional information, and the province of Ontario will collaborate with the federal government. Thank you. The supplementary question, member for Hamilton West, and Cast. Unfortunately, the, the federal government has also excluded the Bradford Bypass from its environmental assessment. But like Highway 413, the Bradford Bypass would cut through the Greenbelt. And like Highway 413, it runs along land uh, owned by well-connected developers who are donors to the PC party. Despite the obvious risk to Ontario's irreplaceable farmland like the Holland Marsh, this Conservative government is still rushing to begin construction on this highway. Why? When so many people are still suffering during the pandemic, is the Premier instead focused on paving over the Greenbelt and paving over farmland on behalf of his friends and his political donors? And to reply, again, the Minister of Transportation. Well, as I've said, uh, the goal of our government um, and of these projects has always been to address congestion and population growth in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. A population boom is coming to the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Mr. Speaker, and there's no getting around it. Our government believes that expanding high the highway network must be part of the solution so that we can get people and goods moving and create good jobs. We cannot rely on transit alone. The opposition is taking a pass on addressing congestion in this rapidly growing area. If you're a union member who works in road construction, the opposition is not on your side. If you're Order. a parent living in York Region Order. who drives to work, the opposition is not on your side. Ontario is investing $82 billion order. in transportation over the next 10 years, $21 billion in highways and bridges, and $61 billion in transit, Mr. Speaker. Response. Our government will explore all options to build transportation links, whether it's transit or roads. Order. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for anti-racism. Yeah. Uh, since the beginning of this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, there has been an alarming rise in anti-Asian racism here in Ontario. Uh, more specifically, a 40% increase in hate incidents here in the province. Minister, you recently put, up, put out an update to the anti-racism strategy in the middle of this pandemic, and to my surprise, the 30-page document that the minister put forward uh, failed to mention any form of anti-Asian uh, hate or racism. In fact, it failed to even mention the word Asian once. So, Speaker, my question to the minister, why did the minister think it was okay to put forward an update to the anti-racism strategy and fail to address the issue of anti-Asian Asian racism, especially considering it's one of the fastest form of hate in this country. To reply, the Solicitor General. Speaker, and thank you for raising this critically important issue. It is uh, disturbing when we see rises in any form of hate speech, but particularly when we're dealing with a pandemic and to now see that individuals are using this opportunity to um, deal and, and spread vile, hateful messages about people. It, um, it's frankly why uh, we as a government have invested and um, partnered with our communities to now offer anti-racism and hate grants. Uh, we all appreciate and understand that zero tolerance is critical, but we need to provide some assistance to those organizations. And to do that, we have established a new anti-racism and anti-hate grant. Uh, this program, through a collaborative approach with community partners, can ensure we advance the most effective solutions in the fight against Response. racism and hate. And I will. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. Um, Asian Canadians should not have to bear racist effects of this pandemic, and the government really needs to step up in and include uh, anti-Asian hate uh, within their strategy. But, Speaker, racial, racialized Ontarians are not only being targeted outside the walls of this legislature, they're being targeted within the walls of this government as well. The government's decision to have people stopped by the police randomly 
and to provide their name and address, otherwise known as carding, was impulsive and poorly thought out. Minister, you have the privilege and the duty to protect racialized Ontarians here in the province of Ontario. But, Speaker, not only did the minister uh, announce this new policy, from what I hear, she was the one who actually championed this decision. What was the minister thinking? As the minister responsible for anti-racism, why didn't the minister stand up and do her job and stand up for racialized Ontarians and put a stop to this backward decision here in the province of Ontario? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. So, as I mentioned, I would like to highlight some of the investments that our government has has been doing, working collaboratively with our community organizations, including a three million dollar. Uh, anti-racism and anti-hate grant to support community organizations and their important work across Ontario, a new anti-racism and anti-hate grant program through a collaborative approach with community partners. Uh, this new granting program, um, $1.6 million in total funding, will be accessible to communities throughout Ontario and the pro the provide investments to community-based projects that address systemic racism and hate, focusing on anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, anti-Semitic and Islamic. Islamophobia. Finally, the new investments build on our investment of $1.7 million through the Safer and Vital Community Grants, funding 26 new community-based programs to combat hate-motivated crimes throughout partnerships with Response. organizations and local police services. We will continue to do our work with con community agencies and, and thank you for raising this issue because it does disturb me when we hear about individuals who are Response. using a pandemic as an opportunity to highlight and, and raise false uh, suggestions about individuals within our society. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, I want to read what a London constituent, Christopher, wrote to me. I am advocating for my brother, who is 69 and has been diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic liver cancer and has been given a window of three to six months. Currently, his access has been good concerning appointments, but things are now starting to be postponed, and I am seeing a decline in his strength since being diagnosed three weeks ago. When he received his first vaccination, he produced a letter, and was he produced a letter from his doctor and was told, not good enough. We need a letter from a medical oncologist. You get your next shot in August. Speaker, he says his brother could be dead by then. He's not alone, Speaker. Barb McQuarrie, a London resident undergoing cancer treatment, told CBC News that she also had to jump through hoops and still hasn't gotten the second dose. Will this Question. government work with public health units, pharmacies, vaccine teams to ensure that cancer patients can seamlessly access their second shots? Mr. Health, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I'm very sorry that your constituents are having such a difficult time obtaining their second shots. We have been taking advice on who should receive the second shot earlier from our medical experts based on the clinical evidence. Uh, we know that people who are in long-term care homes uh, over the age of 80 need to have them within a period of time, and that there are certain types of cancer uh, that uh, must, uh, where people do need to receive their second shots earlier. There are several types that have been identified to us, but certainly we would be happy to work with you to bring your constituents' issues before the, uh, before the medical experts to see what can be done to accelerate their second shot. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that, Speaker, but also we've heard from advocates and they say that the guidelines for exceptions in Ontario aren't clear and many patients are still waiting weeks and sometimes months for their second dose. Martine Elias, the Executive Director of Meloma Canada, said, when Ontario came out with these guidelines, no one on the ground knew what they were. And patients were going to their appointments for their first vaccine and were still getting booked for their second dose four months later. Now that we're seeing this, that the hospitals are providing recommendations to patients about second doses, but it's not happening everywhere. It really depends on where you live. 
Speaker, many cancer patients have had their diagnosis or treatment delayed, which is a very stressful experience. On top of that, they have to navigate this incredibly complex system. Will this government work across the province to Question. ensure equity exempting cancer patients from delayed second doses of the vaccine? Minister Health. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, I would certainly agree that equity is very important across the province for, uh, for all cancer patients to make sure that if they require the second dose in an accelerated manner, that they will get that. We do have a table on the vaccine uh, task force headed by Dr. Uh, Dirk Heyer, who is consulting with other medical experts to understand who needs to have the second shot accelerated. We know that transplant uh, patients do and people with certain types of cancer, but we're learning more every day. I can certainly refer this, and if you can provide me with the information regarding your constituents, I will absolutely provide it to the medical experts to see what can be done for them. Thank you. The next question, yep. the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to ask my question to the Minister of Municipal Affairs, but Premier says I should direct my question to the Minister of Environment. So while it was Minister of the Environment, the new chair of the Greenbelt Council voted against its creation, concerned it would be difficult to remove land from the protected area. I have no doubt that Mr. Sterling will support the government priorities, but I'm afraid those priorities do not support the environment. So my question is, has the government not taken into account Mr. Sterling's previous stance and actions on the matter, or did the government hope the people were not paying attention? To reply, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, thanks, Speaker. I want to thank the honourable member for the question. I, I do find it strange coming from this party, uh, a question given the fact that they carved up the green belt 17 times and removed 370 acres from it. Uh, you know, I I've, I've said many times, uh, Mr. Sterling shares uh, my vision of growing the green belt. We're in the middle of a, a consultation, as members know, and, and I believe we have a great opportunity to grow the green belt uh, in a very significant way uh, since its creation in 2005. But, you know, uh, don't, don't take my word for it. Uh, take a former Minister of the Environment for the Ontario Liberal Party, Jim Bradley, who said, and I quote, here's an individual, Norm Sterling, who was responsible for the Niagara Escarpment Plan, an enduring legacy for him. His initiatives in legislative Response? reform will endure for many years and through many parliaments. Speaker, I agree with Jim Bradley, and I look forward to working with Norm Sterling on growing the Green Belt. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Next, we have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for second reading of Bill 283, an act to amend and enact various acts with respect to the health system. On April 29, 2021, Ms. Elliott moved second reading of Bill 283. On May 4, 2021, Mr. McNaughton moved that the question be now put. The bells will ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes on Mr. McNaughton's motion that the question be now put. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.